Hello, and welcome to the October 2020 Bitcoin Cash Network discussion. These meetings serve as a public forum for presenting initiatives that have an impact on the BCH network, addressing questions about those initiatives from a diverse set of network stakeholders, and then gauging support for relevant aspects of that initiative. Today, we're joined by Callan Kulianu, developer for BCHN and Electron Cash, Tom Zander, founder of Flowey, Josh Green, developer at Bitcoin Verde, Peter Chipper, developer at Bitcoin Unlimited, Paul Chandler, CEO and founder at Aptisio, Andrew Stone, developer at Bitcoin Unlimited, Eleanor Blanc, business developer for Satoshi's Angels, Peter Ng, miner and OTC dealer, Mark Lamb, CEO at CoinFlex, and Mark Lunderberg, independent developer. Uh, so before we begin, I'll review the meeting for more, excuse me, the meeting format. Uh, and this will take just a minute. I think it's important for viewers and potential future participants to know what to expect from the meetings. So each item on the agenda will start with a short presentation. That presentation will cover the topics relevant problem statement or use case, the properties of a good solution or implementation, the status of current solutions or implementations, and finally, any costs of supporting the use case or solving the problem. Once the presentation is finished, the floor will be opened up for questions from present stakeholders. After everyone's questions have been asked, we'll gauge support from present stakeholders for different aspects of the topic as is appropriate. So today's topics will be removing the unconfirmed chain limit presented by Callan Kulianu and double spend proofs presented by Tom Zander. And before we get started, uh, I'd like to just emphasize a couple more things for this inaugural discussion. Uh, one, the meeting format is a work in progress and it can and should change as we recognize how to serve the Bitcoin Cash Network most effectively. So please do give us feedback priv privately or publicly. Uh, two, the meetings do not directly represent the Bitcoin Cash Network because Bitcoin Cash is decentralized. And so there's no such thing as official representation. Uh, instead, each participant represents themselves as a stakeholder in the network. Uh, and then similarly, we do not assume that these meetings will be the only public forum for discussion around B the Bitcoin Cash Network. Anyone else can hold any meetings with any participants with any structure, of course. Uh, we simply aim to be as effective and productive with these discussions as possible. Uh, so with that out of the way, I will turn it over to, and actually I've forgotten who was going first. Was uh, it I'm going first, Callan, yeah. yeah. Very good. All right, Callan, you have the floor. Okay. So removing the unconfirmed TX chain limit, um, problem statement and use case is the first part. So currently there is a 50 long unconfirmed ancestor, ancestor limit for mempool transactions. That is for unconfirmed transactions. You can't have more than 50 of them in a chain. They all depend on each other. So what is an unconfirmed transaction chain? First of all, it's, this is a little bit different than just normal transactions. It's, it's when you have like transaction A sends a coin to somebody and then that's, you know, coin B and then that gets spent, goes on to, to C and then that gets spent and goes on to D. So the same coin basically being passed along like a baton. And if, as long as they're all sitting in the mempool, the limit of that is 50. So it is a bit like passing a baton around. Um, and not everybody does this. When you're normally using your wallet, you wouldn't do this. But um, some applications do rely on this type of thing. And the limit used to be 25 for, for quite a while since, since BCH's inception. And it was recently raised to 50. So the, currently the 50. The limit is 50. You can have 50 of these individual transactions that all spend the same coin, like a baton, um, that gets passed around. Uh, you can have up to 50 of them in the mempool. Um, if you hit that limit, you have to wait. You have to wait for some of those transactions to confirm or all of them to confirm, and then you can continue to pass the baton around. So this limit is not very popular with some businesses and some ecosystem members. There's been... Um, I know Bitcoin.com, Read.Cash, Satoshi Dice, it affects their use cases, some of the things they want to do. They want to be able to, to quickly do chains of transactions. And when they hit this wall, they have to wait or they have to do workarounds. Um, they have to keep more money around and then spend from other coins that aren't in the mempool. And it, uh, there definitely has been pressure to see about raising this limit in the past. And it uh, thankfully, it was recently raised to 50. Basically, we want to investigate how can we raise it since people have been talking, some, some businesses have been talking about wanting it raised. Like, what, you know, what do we need to do? And, um, well, that brings me to my next section, uh, which is properties of a good solution or an implementation. A good solution would significantly raise the limit, um, something like 500 or 1,000 or maybe no limit to the unconfirmed transaction chain. Uh, would be ideal, and you'd want to do this without introducing any DOS vectors. You don't want to make 
uh, it impossible to run a node because it slows to a crawl. Like someone sends like 10,000 transactions in one chain and then like no one can even accept those and all the nodes crash. Like you don't want that, right? <laughs> and so that brings me to why this limit exists actually because the reason why it exists is that as you add transactions to this chain, it gets exponentially more expensive to like to, to update all of the transactions in the chain. And yeah, so it was decided that the limit should be 25 and then it was raised to 50. Now, if you think about it, like you don't, you know, what is so spe special about these transactions that are in a chain? Why, why do you know, why is it so slow to add another one at the end? And um, I, I looked into that a little bit and it seems like uh, one of the things is that these transactions sort of go as a package. They go together and basically they're, they come, they, you sort of, you want to know how much they all cost to confirm to get, like if you're, in, if you're a miner building a new block, maybe you want to pick one of these chains and like put it in the block. And um, so maintaining that state, that fee information is one of the costs. It, it's, a, it's like a, a quadratic pro problem, a uh, big O of N squared to like go back. It's, every time you add one, you have to check with the other ones and like update the fee information. And this, this sort of thing got engineered for BTC and we inherited it apparently. It was engineered, BTC is very fee oriented, the mempool is congested. You know, I mean, it's, it's a nice feature that you're able to maximize profit for miners, that you're able to, to look at these chains of transactions and instantly tell how much each one costs and then, you know, pick a, pick a package. They're called packages. This comes with a great, you know, th this, this feature, this fee package stuff comes with a lot of uh, slowdown. I mean, you can't have more than 50 of these now. And so one of the things I was thinking was, um, and some people have been talking about this, was sort of just doing away with this capability of, of considering transaction chains as a package and then trying to maximize profits for miners. Because right now mining isn't extremely profitable on the fee side. There isn't that much money in fees. And it pro you know, we hopefully, you know, we don't want it to be that like BTC, where you want to maximize profit on fees. So one of the features is called child pays for parent, where you can have, you can attach a transaction at the end that's extremely expensive, that, that pays a lot of fee, and it sort of, it bumps up all of its ancestors, so they all confirm together. And we're, one of the things that I was thinking some people were talking about was getting rid of that feature, and then you sort of simplifies everything. You no longer, you can have like 10,000 transactions in a chain or a thousand or whatever, and you can just keep adding to the chain and you don't have to go back and update all of them and and do all this update stuff. But that's not you know necessarily the only solution. Maybe we can optimize the code. I know BU has uh, done parallelization of this kind of stuff. The current proposal and implementations, like I said, BU has the capability to handle unconfirmed TX chains, I think of up to one, 500. I think someone was telling me that. Actually, I haven't verified this. I could be getting it wrong. Jonathan Tumim has investigated sort of weakening the child pays for parent guarantee uh, which, by the way, nobody uses. Nobody uses child free, as far as I know, like because we don't have a fee pro like a mempool congestion problem. We don't like do have, have like a robust fee market like BTC. So this child pays for parent thing is um, it's something that like it might be a right to weaken or just throw away, right? So then Jonathan Tumim investigated and he's written some code where you can get uh, much faster, like just. Uh, big O of N rather than N squared, then conceivably you could just have a 2,500 TX limit rather than 50, <laughs> right? Just right away for free. <laughs> Assuming this was addressed and somehow child face for parent or whatever the solution is, removing child face for parent, you know, what would the, what would the cost be for this change, right? Um, so the cost is mainly going to be shouldered by the nodes. I think it's basically consensus type rule. Like all the nodes are sort of have to have the kind of the same rules and agree on how to do this. And then you could roll it out as an update and then um, nobody else would really be impacted except for the positive side that they could send longer chains. Like it wouldn't be like, like a DAA where you, you have to update wallets. So the cost would be basically be shouldered by the node implementations. Ideally you'd want to roll it out in sync as a network upgrade if you were to do this because you don't want nodes like banning each other because they're getting too many they don't agree on, you know, you're like, hey, you're sending me too many transactions, you're a spammer, and then like, ban. <laughs> right, so you don't want that to happen. So ideally, it'd be like a heterogeneous, it would be a homogeneous network. And then like for end users, I think like some sites like Satoshi Dice would be really happy if the, the transaction limit, the chain limit was uh, was increased. And I know Bitcoin.com would be happy. And so yeah, I mean, it, the cost would be shouldered by the nose, but the benefit could probably be the entire, you know, you could just do more with BCH. You could have baton like semantics for smart contracts where you just pass a baton around the contract. It's like, <laughs> I don't know. That's so, yeah, so that's that 
that concludes my, uh, my little introduction to this idea of removing the unconfirmed TX chain limit. What I'd like us to do is focus on presenting the presenter with questions. And I just want to make sure that, that while obviously some context will be appropriate, uh, ideally, if this is the sort of thing where it's actually going to be more content uh, explaining the state of the situation, uh, that might be something worth saving for either a, a presentation in the future or BitcoinCashResearch.org. Uh, and so we're going to use the hand raising feature. So I'm just going to ask, first of all, if there's any questions for Callan that clarify the that want to clarify the meaning of his of his presentation if there's anything that you didn't get and so i want to get that out of the way first and i'll give it five seconds uh okay so i do see uh yeah I just uh, andrew you're, you're so, oh, oh. Well, okay if you want to do peter i was going to check if andrew's question fit under that yeah. after i did all that clarification I, I just wanted to know what the um proposal was a proposal to um remove cpfp or um is it to increase the, the obviously to insure, increase the chain limit, but is it also to re remove CPFP completely? It, not necessarily, only if it makes sense. Although I'm I, I, like the proposal that I just gave is basically let's investigate how we can raise the chain limit or remove it. Um, and then let's explore avenues. So one of the avenues might, might be removing CPFP, right? Because nobody cares about it and it comes with a huge cost. Sort of, you know, let's do the engineering required to answer that question. Like how can you raise the limit intelligently? That's, you know, definitely I'm open to CPFP. Yeah. I guess, I, guess I, I, I mean, I don't know if you use a CPFP now because obviously the, the mempools are not nearly full. i um, just wondering if, if anybody knows, you know, is somebody going to use it in the future? Yeah, we or, should first find that out, right? Before we throw out the baby with the bathwater. Yeah. <laughs> find out if we need that baby. Yeah, that's one of the things we should be doing. Did, did you guys see the research I published a couple of months ago, uh, which basically looked at the blockchain and investigated who actually used child pays for parent. And it was like 10 transactions over an entire <laughs> year for an entire or year. three months, something like that. But at least, you know, wow. an extremely low number. We had another another set of uh, a lot more transactions, but they had such ridiculous numbers to them. They can't possibly have been uh, a specific uh to the uh bitcoin cash uh chain they they, they paid uh, so much fees that it sounded more like it was just btc code being run on bch right that happens yeah, and right? i just yeah. want to uh, if, if i may step in i just want to yeah. point out that this is ideally something we'll have prepared you know beforehand uh and so obviously appreciate the presentation but uh before we uh either dig further into the details of whether or not CPFP is is actually is is worth uh, removing since that was only barely touched upon. What I like to do is then leave it for questions for Callan. We'll we'll gauge support for what that what that has been clarified to be the uh, main point, and then we'll just keep moving on so that you know we can not get lost in too much of this. And then someone can we can we can come with an update next time because I uh, basically I think Dev Minutia, uh, and I realize this is borderline Dev Minutia, but I'd like to save that for. Uh, offline, and then we can bring basically the presentations here. Uh, so apologize for cutting you off, but I think that is probably, thank you much. Okay, my apologies. So Andrew, uh, your hand, if you'd like to go ahead. Yeah, there was some, uh, you know, question in the uh, presentation about whether Bitcoin Unlimited could do over 500. Yeah. Um, and so just so that doesn't become like a shelling point, I just want to say <laughs> that, you know, we just picked that number randomly, effectively, because we didn't want to shock the community with an unlimited type number, but okay. certainly, you know, so we can like a same limit, but maybe you can do much more with your parallel. Yeah. Looks up code. Right. Right. Yeah, right. exactly. Got it. Mm -hmm. So you guys can do more, but 500 is your, is you being humble. Got it, got it. Yeah. We just put that out there. <laughs> okay. That's a good goal. Appreciate the clarification. Okay. So, uh, now, if anyone, I mean, we may have already moved on to it, but if anyone has any general questions for Callan without not trying to clarify anything, you'd like uh, either, you know, raise any concerns, but as long as, again, is there a question that something can be addressed by Callan? And if not, then uh, it'll be something saved. So that was Josh. Please go ahead. So I uh, am firstly pretty much very much in favor of uh, uh, removing the, the uh, transaction train limit. Um, but there is, I think, another reason to uh, at least consider keeping it around. Um, and it has to do with the user experience for, for um, uh, transactions that are either double spent or, or not mined. Um, so if you have a very long chain, 
and like the first one happens to not get accepted into a block, then the whole chain of them are no longer valid, and that kind of like branches out uh, a lot. So you can actually have uh, you can have a pretty bad user experience. Um, we don't really have that scenario too much um, because most of our you know like if you send a transaction, it gets mined into a block especially if it gets accepted by you know, your peers. Um, but we do have the scenario of, um, you know, like double spends making that, uh, you know, a degraded user experience. Because if like the great, 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 great ancestor of yours happens to be a double spend. Then right. So th- yeah, that's totally a good point. That should be taken into account. So one thing is you can, uh, there's the double spend proof stuff that Tom is going to present next. But um, Exactly. The other thing is also, you know, you can enforce it on the UI. On the, you know, like, why should the entire ecosystem, like, why should, like, Satoshi Dice not be able to spend to do what they want? You know, maybe you can just have wallets, just to, we encourage wallets to, like, not let users send, like, super long chains that can all get screwed up or something. Like, maybe maybe there's a way we can, you know, we can make everybody happy. Like, have, have a very high limit, but also make sure that users don't do stupid things, you know. Yeah, I think maybe it's like, like, some ideal sweet spot. Yeah, for sure. It's going to be a risk reward, it's, you know. It's risk, yeah, yeah and, but it's definitely a good point. Yeah, it's going to be a risk reward type of thing. And I, I uh, yeah, I mean, so like my question was basically like, do we have anything else uh, in place besides double spend proofs that reduce that? I mean, and that was obviously like relevant because I know we're going to be talking about double spend proofs next. And uh, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but but yeah, I think I mean like ultimately, I don't like I said, I, I'm very much in favor of just removing the whole limit completely. Uh, in fact, Bitcoin Verde like doesn't have the limit. I know some nodes don't. Um, oh, wow. okay. and, do you and, not do uh, the package? Do you not do child pace apparent? Or well, we do like a recursive query for the mempool. So like when like when it's going to calculate <laughs> the fees, we just like let SQL do its thing, and we're like calculate how much this is. And uh, uh, so yeah, it could kind of like Bitcoin Unlimited. It could literally do as many as it wants. Um, Okay. So, I guess I guess we don't want to do too much dev minutiae. John was saying not to do too much. Minutiae. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, okay. but anyway, that, that was my question. I, I think you got it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very good. I see uh, Tom Zander hand up. Yeah. It 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 really fits uh, to to together with the question from Josh. Um, what do we do with with the uh, unconfirmed uh, uh, transactions? Uh, basically, how how can we make it safe for the wallets and? Um, I know some some uh, uh, bigger companies have been asking about this, and and the first thing that I'm wondering about is uh, have they considered to make the wallet uh, before both Roger can answer that maybe make the wallet uh, that they ship also take into account hey there's this this transaction is a is a, a child of 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 of something that's confirmed yeah right 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 maybe I should give right. it a bit more risk uh, yeah. and 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 the guy sees it on his phone hey you should be wary that this transaction might actually need to be confirmed before you give out the goods. Yeah, you know, yeah, something yeah, yeah. In it, it, I think that, most that, yeah. wallets currently are very black and white. You <laughs> either right. see it or you don't. And yeah. we might need a little bit more engineering on, on the wallet side. So I'm not sure if, if Roger is still uh, 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 um, online, if he can answer that. Uh, that, that they might want to actually uh, take a look at that uh, in, in the wallet and, and have a bit of a risk profile to incoming transactions. Anything's possible with the, the UI on the wallets, but I, ideally... Technically, we can make it so it's not an issue, even if you have this long chain of uh, unconfirmed transactions. If one farther up the chain gets double spent, uh, ideally, we just make it so that's not possible. And maybe I'm asking for the impossible, but that would be my ideal situation where we're, you know, we have some sort of pre consensus or some sort of method. Once the <laughs> transaction is broadcasted, even if there's a whole bunch of, you know, ancestors of that transaction, we're still good to go. But uh, we want to make things as easy for the end user and not have to worry about anything as, as, as much as possible. Sure. And just for the record, again, I'm happy for us to have this discussion here now that it's happening. Uh, but ideally, this is another thing that will be done even before we hear. You know, we'll have reached out to specifically, you know, uh, Bitcoin.com and Satoshi Dice and find out exactly what it is that they would want and what they would what what they're willing to do. Uh, or, or maybe in having it would involve more devs explaining what would need to be done. But either way, uh, ideally, this will be done before so that we can come in and we can say. Bitcoin.com has given X confirmation and this other business has given some other X confirmation. Uh, but of course, not going to uh, quell any discussion as it, as it happens naturally here. Uh, so hands up. I think once your hands up, you may have to manually put it down. Uh, Josh, do you have another one? 
yeah, so I was thinking the um, one thing I'm going to post this after Bitcoin or after this meeting for the, on the BitcoinCashResearch.org website. But um, I think we should probably do some research for what that looks like on on actually even propagating the double spends because if your ancestor is a is a double spend, like not everyone's going to expect accept that. So like the children are going to also be uh, invalid when they get propagated. So we actually like might not even have too much like that you that degraded use user experience might be extra hard to even encounter, but I think we should definitely do some due diligence to, to figure out what that looks like. I agree. Yeah. I'll yeah. Do a thing on it after. Yeah. No. Well, Andrew, would you like to do you have another question? I wanted to comment on uh, Josh Green's, uh, his, his scenario. And that was, uh, um, please consider, um, let's say you had a, uh, a transaction chain of say 500 transactions, right? And um, you somehow managed to get that 500th and put it, <laughs> uh, show it to a wallet. Then yeah. in that case, if the limit is 50 per block that can be confirmed, the double spender has 10 opportunities, right? Uh, five, you know, 500 divided by 50 to double spend that transaction, right? Whereas if all of those transactions were confirmed um, in the single block, then the double spender would just have one opportunity. So there's actually an argument um, that says, in fact, if you know the the network really ought to confirm every single transaction that it sees, and yes, the you know wallets should put up you know the appropriate warnings and disallow double spending of certain depth and so forth. Yeah, I think that's a very good argument, right? Um, <laughs> totally. Yeah. Oh, sorry. There's another hand. Let's go ahead, Mark. Oh yeah. Sorry. Just wanted to address the Tom or what uh, Andrew was saying there. So. Um, there isn't a limit on 50 per block right now. There's only a limit on what gets into the mempool. And blocks themselves can have unlimited chains. And it's, there's actually no performance degradation if a block is you know, 32 megabytes of one giant chain. It's the same as if it were all independent transactions. Actually, probably a bit faster because all the sure. UTXs are, are cached. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So, That's true. <laughs> right, but if they're um, not in the mempool, they can't get into a block. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I'm just saying that the scenario of having ten blocks in a row, I don't, I don't quite understand. But, anyways, well, I guess that's a technical thing. Sure. Imagine and, and BU is holding five hundred uh, unconfirmed transactions ah, okay. limit of okay, five hundred, and we're trying to push fifty at a time to the rest of the network. Yeah, like right? BCH on nodes or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I right, would imagine right, exactly. that. And so like we're in this situation. This is a like really strange <laughs> thing. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. Right. Well, I wouldn't call it strange, right? An attacker could easily uh, create their own full node that behaves in this exact way. And, uh, you know, if it's able to connect to your wallet, it can present that transaction as inside the Bitcoin network when it's really not. Right, like they could set up a fulcrum server and have an electron cache. Yeah, you can sure, imagine. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, uh, That's so a good going, point. Going further on this point, though, with about long chains and the UI experience on wallets, like I don't think 50 versus 50,000 really makes a big difference because what tends to happen in the mempool is you get a lot of like unrelated activity happening, like different economic actors are doing different things. And so if there's somebody trying to pull off some sort of exploit, it's going to be affecting, you know, one one part of that, net, the, that network. And um, if it's 50 long or 50,000 long or unlimited, I don't think it becomes any harder or easier. Wait, so um, you're saying that the limit is there for no reason? <laughs> Just that, well, the limit is there only to prevent... Um, uh, you know, the denial of service, this quadratic thing that you're mentioning, right? right. Uh, this fee optimization problem. Yeah. Uh, I think that's when it was introduced and that's like, it's there. It's It comes together with that whole fee optimization thing, basically. Um, okay, so I realized we, we haven't yeah. reached necessarily, you know, uh, uh, even an agreement on, on what we're talking about, maybe at, at, the, at the deepest level. Uh, but if it's all right, I'd like to move on to just measuring support for at least the things that, that we can uh, sort of quantify what we're, we're covered in the in the presentation. So, uh, in this case, I think we'll also use the the raised hands feature. So make sure everyone's hands are not raised. I believe we're all good there. Uh, and and first, I'd just like to 
update from everybody and, and feel free to, you know, uh, vote or abstain from voting if you feel like you're not a stakeholder in this case. Obviously, however much you are a stakeholder, uh, it's just that's however much, uh, however appropriate it will be for you to uh, make your opinion heard at this point. So first, uh, hands, I would like you to raise your hand if you agree that raising the unconfirmed chain limit in some way is a goal that is worth the costs. Uh, and there is a there's a feature in Jit out. Oh, very good, thanks. All right, so we have hands raised from uh, Calvin Kulianu, Mark Lunderberg, Tom Zander, Mark Lamb, and both uh, Peter Ung, uh, Paul Chandler, Josh Green, uh, Peter Chipper, Andrew Stone, Roger Veer, Fernando Pelliccioni, and uh, I'm not a stakeholder, at least not for now. <laughs> uh, so that's uh, Everybody, if it looks like, but if not, it's everybody whose name I read. Uh, and actually, well, while I'm thinking of it, thank you, Roger Veer, uh, executive chairman at Bitcoin.com, if I still have the uh, title correct, and Fernando Pelliccioni, uh, lead developer at Knuth, and uh, also uh, contributor at uh, Bitcoin Cash Node. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, so the next thing that I'd like to ask, um, that uh, which is, I realize it's effectively the same question, but again, I think it's good to have it uh, sort of officially recorded. Uh, if you consider yourself a stakeholder who would have to invest something, if there's a cost for you, uh, if you are involved in a project that would need to do work uh, in order to what, do what we have established here, which at this point is really just look further into the problem. Uh, I think that's what we established here. Uh, if, if you're a stakeholder in that aspect and think uh, that it will be worth the cost to you to invest in looking into a solution for increasing the chain limit, uh, if you would please raise, raise your hand. All right, we've raised hands from Calvin Kulianu, Mark Lundeberg, Tom Zander, uh, Mark Lamb, and Peter Ong, I assume both. Uh, very good, thank you. Uh, we have Josh Green, Peter Chipper, Andrew Stone, uh, and Fernando Pelicioni. Uh, and then, so the last, uh, for the end of the presentation, I'd just like to turn it over to Colin one more time to ask, uh, is, is, there any, is there another piece of this that you think needs uh, to have support gauged, or do you think we've pretty much covered with, with that until the next meeting? Um, and I think we have covered it until the next meeting. It sounds like, uh, yeah, very good. Thank you very much. All right. So, uh, up next we have presentation, uh, from Tom Zander on double spend proofs. In order for Bitcoin cash to be useful as cash, merchants really need to be able to accept zero cost transactions, which are transactions that haven't been added to a block yet, because otherwise they'd have to wait for an average of 10 minutes after each payment. Currently, a thief can create two conflicting transactions, one that pays the merchant and another that uh, sends the same money back to himself and send both to this network at the same time. And some of the time he will walk away with the goods he bought and the transaction that sends the money back to himself will be the one that makes it to the next block instead of the one that sends the money to the merchant. This is called double spending. And in that case, the thief will have successfully stolen from the merchant. A system that notifies merchants about the existence of a conflicting transaction within several seconds would eliminate that risk, allowing them to react to the situation however they think is appropriate, for example, by withholding the goods or alerting law enforcement. Merchants that are expected to release goods to the customer shortly after payment benefit most from the double spend proofs. Brick and mortar stores and online shops that deliver electronic goods would have their payment experience improve dramatically and would have their fraud risk almost completely eliminated. Let's look at some properties of a good solution. First of all, a solution to double spend problems should not even try to decide which of the two transactions should be the normal versus the stealing one. This is impossible to do objectively in a decentralized system and a notification of the double spend is all that's needed for the people involved to react. Currently, nodes reject conflicting transactions. 
A solution should also not involve forwarding all transactions no matter what. While it may seem like that would allow more nodes to detect double spends and then provide a notification to the involved wallets, it turns out that it also helps the thief to double spend more often because it helps those conflicting transactions that would otherwise simply be rejected by the node to be seen by many more. Instead, a solution should allow you to prove that a double spend has occurred without actually forwarding the second transaction and without providing enough information to reconstruct that second transaction. A simple notification is not good enough because then a node would send false double spend notifications and disrupt the payment process that way. The message should still prove that a double spend has occurred. And finally, the solution should notify the wallets that are involved in a double spend. So here is my proposal. The double spend proof specification I've been working on is in essence a message containing two signatures made by the same private key, both say signing the same transaction output, but for different transactions. It fulfills all of the criteria that were just covered. It does not try to determine which transaction is the correct one and which is the double spend. It doesn't require forwarding the second transaction to anybody else, and it doesn't require forwarding enough information to reconstruct the second transaction. It cryptographically proves a double spend has occurred, preventing notes from faking double spends. And it notifies the wallets involved in a double spend transaction. Let's take a look at the cost of double spend proofs. A complete implementation of the double spend proofs will involve software at every layer of the Bitcoin Cash development stack. Nodes need to implement creating and forwarding these double spend messages. So far, Flowey, the Hub, and BU full nodes have already added my proposed implementation. BCHD and BCHN plan to have it implemented by November. The minimum percentage of the network nodes that need to implement these proofs for them to be reliable is about 40%. Many middleware solutions, like the REST APIs and the block explorers, would also need to implement the feature so that services that depend on them can take advantage of it. Wallets and point-of-sale software need to implement listening for these double spend proof messages and then also implement a user notification. Businesses that take advantage of these proofs will need to train their personnel to react to double spend notifications. The idea of a fraud alert will probably not be an alien concept to point of sale workers uh, minimizing the extra work required and the reduced fraud risk may make it profitable investment in the long term. Thanks very much, Tom, for putting that together. Uh, just like before, if we could start with uh, any questions that are specifically about the the meaning or the, the intent, just to get that out of the way, uh, please raise your hand if any if you have a question along those lines. Uh, we'll open it up to just any any general questions for Tom. Uh, please go ahead and raise your hands now if you have any. Very good. I see no hands, uh, so we can go ahead and. Uh, gauge support. I'll probably let's let's skip to the second one uh, instead of just a general showing of, of support. Um, as a stakeholder, to whatever degree uh, you have stake in this decision, uh, please uh, raise your hand if you agree that the uh, use case of adding double spend proofs is worth it to you, given the investment that you expect to have to make to make it a reality in whatever facility. Uh, you would have to do that work. All right, we have hands from Calvin Culliano, Tom Zander, Josh Green, Peter Chipper, Andrew Stone, and Roger Veer, and Fernando Pelliccioni. All right, uh, and then I'd like to just ask Tom, uh, are there any specific parts that you think uh, should be should have support gauge for them. Any specific parts um, about the proposal uh, besides generally uh, 
that, that you would like to get feedback on, not, and not necessarily feedback, but feedback as in just general support, whether you have agreement with anything? Yeah, right. The, the, um, the proposal and, and, and the code that we already have is, uh, is, is in some ways quite far along. Uh, we already have a, a good amount of support in uh, several uh, full nodes uh, that are creating them. But this is something that uh, we we would like to have more companies, stakeholders come up and say, "Hey, uh, I, I'd like to add this to Fulcrum. I'd like to add this to uh, the REST APIs and, and and stuff like that, and uh, wallet makers." Uh, so it's not so much. I think in in this uh, uh, meeting, I think we've got a good indication that people are interested in that. It's I get for, more for the viewers. You know, is there um, is there some more uh, support to be got uh, by uh, others that are doing some some work that are uh, making a wallet that are working on REST API uh, or anything else that you know comes that that settles between the full node and uh, something that an end user sees that would care about this. Um, they would want to have uh, support. And I think, uh, for instance, the, 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 the CoinFlex guys uh, might be interested as well to, you know, see if they could use this to uh, try out if they can have more uh, um, feedback and, and, and get uh, more secure payments when people deposit money at their place. You know, it's just those, those uh, yeah, it, it covers everybody, basically. Uh, it's a new tool for a lot of people to uh, use now it's there and I think that would be fantastic for people to you know start using because then we, we get a better uh, more secure system I, mean, I admit I didn't uh, quite follow but Josh does have his hand up so if you have if you'd like to just follow up with the question since we didn't have any please go ahead oh well I maybe we should give someone else an opportunity to an answer his question I mine's not really good and then I guess I should ask: Did did everyone else? Uh, I had trouble following what the question that was being asked was. Uh, I mean, it wasn't really a specific question. It was more of a general: uh, 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 who can who can see them using double spend proofs in their own product to increase the um, the, the, the the payment. Uh, the, the unconfirmed transactions being more secure, basically, is is there there. Uh, not just here, but also in general, are there people that are interested in doing that? And uh, I would like to have people, you know, uh, uh, reach out or join or whatever. Sorry, it's not very <laughs> well right, formulated, I, mean, uh, I guess. Again, for the uh, for the record, this this also might be the sort of thing just to sort of establish this early on. It might be painful early on, and maybe we'll have to change the format. But generally, I think that's the sort of thing that ideally will happen before or even here. We know we'll reach out to. Uh, uh, presenters will reach out to any parties they think will have vested interest uh, and be able to show up to this meeting with, you know, uh, uh, a statement from stakeholders if we're not able to bring them here ourselves. Uh, and and then it'll be easy. You know, they'll be here to say, yes, I did say that. And it, it is valuable to me. And we we won't have to really hash much of that out here. Yeah, I'm just uh, talking to the uh, people that are looking at the recording because uh, a lot of people are here already. It's actually quite uh, impressive to see the amount of support, and I don't want it to be uh, a presentation and then no questions. Um, so the <clears throat> the unlike the previous issue, which had like not issue but you know proposal that had uh, like it has a non-zero risk to an uncoordinated deployment. Um, does Zero uh, or does uh, double spend proofs at all like pose any risk to the network of an uncoordinated uh, deployment, or is this any something that we can do at any point in time? And is there a benefit if we all do it at the same time? Uh, yes, yeah, good question. Um, so there is a bit of a risk that, technically speaking, we're kind of expecting to be be passed already in a couple of months uh, if wallets uh, start depending on it but the uh, infrastructure including full nodes don't uh, have good enough support for them yet so you, you, you might not be connected to uh, the, the origin uh, via a path of transactions yet which means that you know you could depend on it but you don't get the message while you expected it and 
with now several nodes already supporting it. And uh, we hope to get more of them uh, to support it in the next couple of months. Uh, that risk is basically, uh, uh, we expect that to be no longer there anymore. Then it just becomes a case of the next layer has the same problem. So if you have a wallet that connects to uh, Electron X protocol, but the Electron X protocol has a, a dozen servers, uh, all of them should be upgraded. And ideally, they all upgrade at the same time, or you just basically can't promise that you actually get the uh, message in the wallet until some months later when they all are upgraded. You see where I'm going? It's, it's, it's a phase thing, first infrastructure, and then the wallets can do it because otherwise people that use the wallets are gonna uh, expecting it while it's not really sent yet. That's basically the biggest risk. And I think that's a very small risk because it's it's going to be built in in order anyway. So it's probably not going to be something that, that happens within a week anyway. So um, I think it's manageable. That makes sense, thanks. Uh, I will get to Callan in just a second. Uh, we do have a, a, a couple of questions from YouTube, which I would like to get to you at least before I forget. Uh, so from JT Freeman, we have, do double spend proofs help outside of POS systems? And this may uh, sort of call back to the question you were even maybe asking to the group. Uh, and so that can be both to you, Tom, and then uh, probably to anyone else. Anyone else knows of specific examples where double spend proofs help besides you know, point of sale situations? <laughs> Yeah, so the, the, the main uh, argument is for point-of-sale systems, brick-and-mortar and electronic stores that basically ship their uh, electronic goods immediately. They are the main benefits. Um, what we are hoping for is to establish that the zero confirmation transaction uh, drops in risk to a very maintainable risk uh, to, to basically be risk-free. And then you can see there are other use cases, like for instance, uh, an exchange could lower the amount of uh, confirmations it needs. Yeah, of course, wallets peer-to-peer -peer is kind of like a point of sale, but uh, um, um, it, it's more personal. And I think that we basically have 99% of the ecosystem done, done already. And then also we have from Matthew G says, I would like to know what the general criticisms of DS proofs were, but all we know who, and that may have uh, not been supposed to be the end of the sentence, but hopefully you get the gist. Uh, maybe, but do you know of any general criticisms of DS proofs in general or the current implementation or any downsides maybe? When we had a, a, a workshop in 2018 in Italy, there was a, a nice uh, set of people doing uh, descriptions of, of uh, how they would like to see this done instead. And I had addressed that in my introduction. Uh, the main suggestion back then was to forward the entire second transaction. Um, we figured out later on that this was uh, actually a really bad idea because it made uh, transaction uh, double spending much more easy. Um, and I think this is not done in the, on the network anymore. So uh, that's the only criticism I know of. If anybody else has any, I'd love to address that. Very good. And uh, Mark, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, I, I guess I could uh, throw out some criticisms just to, as examples. Um, so uh, what about uh, denial of service? Like uh, there's additional network traffic that anybody can induce across the whole network by sending like one small message, right? You just have to create two conflicting transactions and send them out. And then there's extra activity all in the network, but you only have to pay for one transaction. So is, is that a concern? Um, as far as I know, no, uh, if it's programmed correctly, but... Um, what, what do you see as, the, as far as the denial of service risks to the network? I think that would be the main one as far yeah. as rolling out on infrastructure. Yeah, we, we looked at that uh, early on and uh, the basic design is that if you get a double spend transaction, uh, any node will refuse to forward it unless it also finds uh, one of the transactions that it is about in its mempool, which basically means that uh, you cannot send more double spend transactions, sorry, double spend proofs than transactions. They all have to match 
one. And so you come to the basic question, can you spam, can you DOS the network with transactions that are actually accepted in a mempool? And I think that's basically an open question. Uh, I think we, we are pretty sure that you can't, and we are working on that. But it, it, it doesn't uh, add any acceleration to the system. Uh, it, it basically is, is a one-to-one. If you have one double spend proof, you have to have one transaction in your mempool already accepted, which in short means there's no DOS uh, effect <laughs> to, to uh, conclude that. Yeah. All right. And I, I have some other questions, maybe, but I don't know if this, if you want to follow up. This is well, the okay. So time. again, it, yeah. uh, it might be the sort of thing that at this point we want to save for later, uh, if it's uh, that stuff. But I mean, again, if it's a, if it's a short question that kind of puts the ball in his court to elaborate on, please go right ahead. Um, crap! I forgot the question. <laughs> no, never mind. I'll think of it later. <laughs> All right. So. Um, and I apologize. Uh, we did we did do a gauging of support initially, uh, and then oh that's right. And then I, I asked uh, Tom. So that pretty much covers everything. I do have a couple uh, questions from YouTube for the previous uh, subject, and also I would just like to point out that um, as much as it, we're trying to make it structured, you know, with 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 specific questions that sort of put the ball in the, in the back in the presenter's court. That's the analogy I'm not going to stop using. Uh, I would like to especially encourage business owners and 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 basically non-developers uh, if they have practical uh, input that uh, is more along the lines of just providing feedback. Uh, you're the ones we want to hear from because dev minutia can happen outside of here. And ideally, uh, uh, communication with businesses about support and the details will also happen outside of these meetings so we can come with it prepared. But if there's a practical uh, 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 if there's practical input that someone has as uh, a business representative, please feel free to obviously raise your hand and bring it up. And uh, if it's so far out of left field, uh, we could talk about it later. But uh, I, I prefer to err on the side of having input from from that uh, uh, group of people in this meeting. Uh, so the, the the questions from YouTube uh, for the previous subject, uh, one from Phil Harris09 asking, does increase of chain limit help exchanges? Uh, and then, uh, Callan, you have pr- priority answering that, but then also anyone else who uh, has thoughts yeah. on it, please feel free to well, raise your hand. That's a good question. Does it help uh, Does it help exchanges? It may. They do move money around a lot, right? They have, the, conceivably, exchanges have thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of coins sitting around, and they may want to shuffle them around. I mean, exchanges typically wait for confirmations for most of the business they do, right? They don't like the risk... I don't. I actually don't know the answer to that question. If it helps exchanges more or not, um, I'd like to find out as well. That's a very good question. Actually, I'll keep that in mind. I, I would like to find out as well if the, if it helps them. Mark or Peter, go ahead. Yeah, it helps on the withdrawal side um, because on the deposit side, you might you might be waiting for a confirmation, um, and there are some businesses that don't, but like blockchain poker. But on the withdrawal side, it definitely does because oftentimes exchanges structure their transactions where there's a change that's 100% of the balance of that address, and then um, they're spending out of out of a single address, and then you don't have to worry about um, basically hot wallet management as much. That makes that a lot of sense. Yeah, I can imagine that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. On the withdrawal side, yeah. Very good. Thank you. And then I think uh, let's see. Do we have one more question? Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. There was a second after that question. Does uh, does increase in chain limit help exchanges or double spend proofs? Uh, so, uh, Callan or also uh, Mark, if you'd like to take that one too, do you know uh, if double spend proofs, uh, for example, would maybe uh, make uh, make it viable to lower you know confirmation requirements or anything like that? Oh, uh, I mean, I imagine the two go hand in hand, right? Because there's the issue with if you have longer chains, you sort of want to know if if there's a chance that the whole chain can collapse. So with the double spend proof, you get you can get to find out if one of the early transactions in the chain is gonna collapse, is gonna is gonna is, is double spent, there's a chance that the entire chain will get confirmed. So they do they, you know they synergistically <laughs> go together. Uh, you know they help each other out. Double spend proofs and unconfirmed transaction chain increasing. They both they work together. Does that answer the question or perhaps somewhat? <laughs> I'll just add as well. I think we're good. Yeah, go ahead. 
it's very useful to be able to con to confirm um, transactions in the system without waiting on a confirmation, even if it's like a you do it for only certain low value things or something like that. It's it's super useful. So the faster customers get their money, the better. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I tend to agree. Very good. Pardon me while I just peruse the last of the questions coming in. It's like a couple of these maybe are not quite on topic enough for the presentations that were given today. Uh, one specific question, uh, this was addressed to Roger, but I'm, I'm sure anyone who uh, else who has uh, an opinion on it, the question is, does it matter if the unconf limit goes to 1,000 compared to unlimited? And this also may have been touched on a little bit already. We, we don't know if it matters or not, right? Uh, who knows what use cases aren't going to be put into you know, use if it's not unlimited. Uh, so in my ideal world, it would be unlimited for the use cases I know of myself at hand, like a thousand would probably be just fine. But maybe other people have, you know, chains of dividends going out to people all over the world and who knows what they want to do. So, uh, you know, the more, the more useful things people can do with the chain, the better. Very good. Thank you. And then uh, maybe just one more question for YouTube. Thank you all for, for sticking around through this part. Uh, uh, from JT Freeman, uh, I guess this is this is you know, uh, anec they're not anecdotally related, but uh, semi-related. Uh, it's asking what is the, what are what is the chance of minor assisted double spend attack? And I guess that's sort of uh, given that we're 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 talking about solving uh, the 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 double spend that uh, sends two transactions. There's there are other types of double spend. So would you maybe just take a second to talk about what what the risks are for those compared to the ones that we're solving? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this this was originally called the Halfini attack, and that is a good ind indication of how old the idea is. Um, and the, the minor assisted double spend attack is, is essentially invisible to the network because it happens uh, behind the scenes, and and only when the block comes out do we see that indeed it has been double spend. The tricky part here is that it's not really a technical thing. It's more of an economical or market thing that you, you uh, talk about because uh, as it is, uh, as we're seeing the, the miners more centralized, uh, we, we would used to have lots of people using CPU miners and now they're uh, going to pools. And you can't really have one guy doing mining and then going to a store and, and spending it anymore. That's just not the way it is because this, this one miner doesn't decide what he puts in a pool, it is, sorry, in a block. So as we go to a much bigger system where much more money goes into mining, the chance of this happening goes down considerably because it basically is economics problem at this point. I think that the best description of this uh, is, is uh, a very old uh, blog from uh, uh, Gavin Andreessen for the LOLs, where he essentially explained how it was so cheap to make a block back then. And nowadays you get so much money out of it. Why would you do that? It just doesn't make any economical sense. So yeah, sure. It's, it's possible, but at the same time, it is extremely implausible. And also, it means that as the economics go, it just isn't a risk to the average uh, uh, storekeeper because the amount of times this can happen is extremely low compared to the amount of uh, transactions that actually go through the system. It's not really something you want to solve because it isn't uh, there isn't a benefit cost benefit uh, as far as I can tell that helps you solve it uh, it would be too costly to solve it for the uh, harm it actually causes the network I haven't really seen anybody complain about it to be completely, to be completely honest that it happened to them was was your hand up Colin Oh uh, yeah, I just wanted to chime in that uh, just to be clear, it sounds like for double spend proofs, we're talking about day to day purchases. Like you know, you go to the store and you buy ten dollars worth of I don't know <laughs> peanuts or something, or you go to the bar and you order a, you order a drink. I mean, for those small purchases, you're not going to like get like a huge mining pool to like commit fraud for you. I mean, it doesn't make sense. If you're buying a car, you wait for confirmations. I mean, that's that's how I understood it. Is that correct, uh, Tom? Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. the the the, uh, the cost 
uh, of doing such a spend, double spend has gone up quite considerably because the network got bigger, because the amount of uh, money going in on mining. Uh, you know, if they, they make a, a several thousand per block, do they really care about the $10 extra that you can double spend? And at the same time, the amount of transactions that we actually have are going up. So the it, it doesn't really make economic sense in, in, in bottom line. I, I'd have to write it down a bit more to, to flush out my thoughts, but this is the general gist of it. Thank you. Uh, Josh, go ahead. Uh, so my question is actually uh, a response um, uh, to the previous question from YouTube about like, does it make sense to have a thousand or unlimited? Um, so if that's if what Mark's about to ask is relevant to what we were just talking about, then I think maybe he should go first. But I don't know what he's going to ask. Or, Mark, is that uh, sure. were you going to respond to something that Tom just said, or bring up something somewhat separate? Oh, my hand went up again. Uh, actually, yeah, I did have a question. I was, so I was asking, I was, uh, I was, well, was going to sort of make an observation, which is, it, it's all about the risk and reward. Like, uh, you know, if you're waiting for one confirmation, there's still a risk you're going to be defrauded. And, you know, if you wait for 100 confirmations, still there's a risk, right? So, you really, yeah, you just have to, you know, look at how big the purchase is and uh, compare it to what's the risk that you're going to be defrauded for that purchase. And um, you know, one one versus zero confirmations is 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 on that spectrum of you know risk. It's it's not uh, it's not black and white. You know, they're not totally different. So, yeah. Thanks, Josh. We want to go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, the 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 max transaction chain limit is actually something that we encountered during a demo um, for the city of Dublin's like token system that they were using, and we had like we had like. I think it was like a hundred people signed up at all at once. And then we hit like the transaction chain limit and, and then like the user experience from their perspective. And then also the user experience as a system was like awful. Uh, because when you hit that limit, like your transaction isn't really invalid. It's just, it doesn't get accepted. And a lot of times you don't get like a reject message message. So you actually just broadcast this transaction and it just falls on the floor and you as a you as a, a system don't even know that it wasn't accepted so now you're sitting with a bunch of transactions that are valid and in your like applications wallet that like you will try to chain on top of when the next block comes and you like you know that transaction doesn't exist and and then you basically like stall your own system uh so the user experience from a developer's perspective uh like a not protocol developer but a an application developer um sucks when you hit this limit um so the concept of um uh so the cost is really high if you don't account for that um but then the concept is well is a thousand enough and i mean like the reality too is it's not just your transactions for a thousand right it's also like if someone sent you an input that you try to spend that also happens to be 500 or you know 900 or something like that that still counts for you so if you then go and create a hundred more on your own you're still going to hit that limit um so as long as there is a limit i would definitely urge uh uh, application developers to consider handling that case um, because the the user experience degrades so fast uh, if you don't. So I would say like the cost from non uh, non so the cost from application developers uh, is still really really high even if we have any limit whatsoever. Um, because you need to account for it. But if there is no limit ever, and you never have to write code to, like handle that, then your cost of development can be less. Um, so that is, I think, one thing to consider when contemplating, well, do we just make the limit something really, really big, or do we make it you know, non-existent? Um, that was just food for thought that came up. All right, I appreciate the input. So, uh, I'm sorry, Callan, do you have one, one last thing? This will probably be it, I think. Yeah, I just wanted to to address what Josh was saying. Like, it, it seems possible to not have a limit so far for my and preliminary engineering. And like, it, it seems like that's something that can happen, but we'll see. I don't I don't want to go out and say that, but yeah, I mean, I'm thinking along those lines as well. I agree with you. Basic. That's what I want to say. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Very good. Thanks. So um, I would like to encourage folks who who gave their presentation today. Well, first of all, thank you very much for presenting and thank. Every, I'd like to thank everyone else for attending and uh, giving your time and, and making your voice heard. You know, that's invaluable and, and doing it in a public forum, I think, is also invaluable. Uh, 
so that you know other people can know kind of what's what's going on. I think we also found out that maybe the the proposals given today uh, there there are things that need to be done practically, like finding out you know exactly what businesses are going to benefit and getting their input beforehand and their support even beforehand so that we can know for sure like yes there there are people who want this you know uh and and we definitely established at least some of that today uh, obviously uh but i uh, the parts that were missing today i think would be entirely appropriate to bring up in in a future meeting as a follow up presentation and i think that's also something we'd like to establish is the potential at least for follow up presentations when uh something was left open-ended uh, like it was today. Uh, so I, I think that'll pretty much wrap us up. Uh, again, thank you all for watching. Uh, viewers, please go ahead and you know subscribe to the channel. Uh, if, you, if anyone is interested in participating in these meetings or bringing a proposal to the meetings, uh, please check out bitcoincashnetworkdiscussions.org. Uh, from there, you could have, there's the link to our YouTube channel. There's the link to the Telegram group uh, where we recommend that people bring in preliminary uh, uh, versions of their proposals so that, you know, we can make sure that they are up to the, the standards we're, we're trying to set here so that, you know, we can, we can have ec extra productive and, uh, smooth meetings where, you know, it's, uh, facts get laid out and then stakeholders make their voices heard, uh, and we can move on. Uh, and beyond that, I haven't written out an intro, but thanks very much, everybody. Uh, for tuning in and for joining me. Uh, it's much appreciated. Thank you, John. Thank you. Cheers, all. And keep lightning. If you want to kill the stream, thank you very much. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you. Are we? Thanks. Thanks, Thanks. all.